Well, I'm both fed up. I've eaten so much, I'm both fed up. <laughs> and, uh, but I, uh, I'm not giving up, I know that. I want to thank everybody for your hospitality and this beautiful uh, neck of the woods. And uh, to be out and about, I um, was able to do a lot of walking today, but again, I ate more than I walked, but I thank everybody, and I just uh, really enjoyed Hoyt being uh, your guest, and also understand something about casting. Um, oh, I thought he was doing something for Hollywood and had a bunch of casting things going on, but no, now I know what it's about. And a very, very interesting um, afternoon there with uh, Hoyt and his son, and and his son-in-law, and just appreciate so much. And uh, I know, I know there's a heavy weight on, on the congregation with uh, those who passed away, and you're going through some health issues, and uh, th this is part of what life's all about. And when you get involved in the Lord's kingdom, we realize there's a greater place ahead. And yet we struggle here on this earth, and uh, we hurt sometimes for those who are hurting, and sometimes we don't know exactly what to say or how to say it, but our prayers, a, a hug sometimes, or a handshake, or just being around that kind of gives a, a great gratitude of comfort to people. God says He's a God of all comfort. He is a God of compassion. And what amazes me is uh, when I have been around those who've gone through tragedy and loss, they always talk, those who have a, a faith in God, talk about how God has given them faith and strength beyond their means and understanding. And to me, that's an encouraging thing, that even through uh, struggles or hard times or death of loved ones, uh, God fills somehow or another the void that we ourselves cannot and no one else can take care of. Um, that's the kind of God he is. And that's the kind of God he says he wants to be and is going to be. There is going to be trials. We're told that in the scriptures. There's going to be uh, hard times in life. Uh, life is not easy. My mom, she's 89 years old and she has a lot of health issues. And she says you can't be a wimp and be old at the same time. And uh, so I thank God for all the ones who are going through things, but yet continue to praise God and give him glory. Uh, I want to thank the preachers, wife and daughters there. I had a nice time with them, meal. Uh, we uh, ate at the beer place, and uh, <laughs> I've never been there before. <laughs> what bear, what's it? Papa. And my name, my, my grandchildren called me Papa. I should have taken a picture. No, I better not, but uh, they would have given me a hard time. But no, I really enjoyed that. Enjoyed the. Uh, no, no, I didn't drink. Too much. <laughs> You all hear about that deacon in the church? He was right down the road and he was swerving all over the place. And a policeman pulled him and says, uh, hey, deacon, what are you up to? What are you drinking? He said, I ain't drinking nothing but water. And the police said, nothing but water. So, well, let me smell it. See, the policeman backed up and he said, that ain't water. And the old deacon said, praise the Lord, he done done it again. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I tell you, we, uh, I uh, talk about meals and I do meals, but there's no greater meals that I can find than what the scriptures has to say. You know, the Lord has always invited us on the first day of the week, come around his table to be a part of the Lord's supper, the meal there that they always say that you realize what supper is. That's your main meal. And I believe the Lord's supper is the main meal. It is something that we as Christians love to uh, be around to remember and to reflect and to praise God of what's going on and what he's done and what he's doing. But I also found that there are other meals I like to read about and be a part of. And uh, when it comes to homecomings and revivals and meetings, as always, there's always food involved there. Uh, I've never had a revival meeting that would say, hey, we're going to have a revival of uh, a meeting and fasting. <laughs> I wouldn't take it if they asked me. But anyway, they, uh, that might be something I need to uh, go to and be a part of. But I want to share with you some meals that are in the scriptures. There's three of them that we're going to be looking at in these next couple of nights. And the first one, all of them are found in the book of Luke. In fact, that's the only gospel that records any of these meals. They may talk about the incidents of what's going on, but it gives us a little background. In the book of Luke, he's very, um, I guess, distinct about things. He goes into detail, great detail. Uh, Luke has gives more detail about the uh, incidences of Jesus. 
and of the ones that are apostles or other events more than any other writer in the Bible. But Luke is very interesting, not just being a doctor, but being a wordy person, he writes about things. He, he, he picks up on stuff that others don't. That's what's so great about the scriptures as they are written. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the author, but he uses people with their talents and their abilities to produce. And in these instances, Luke is going to produce some, I think, some fantastic stuff if you want to look with me on that. The first one we're going to go to is found in Luke chapter 7, and it will start with verse 36. But before we got there, Luke is writing all kinds of things, all the events of what Jesus is going through. Um, he has uh, kind of talked, he gave the sermon, he's uh, been through a, a different ministries, he's uh, healed some people, healed a dead person there. Uh, he's done amazing things, he's got quite a following. And so it says that there's two different types of uh, meals back in the day of Rome and the Jewish occupation and this time of when Jesus was on earth. They called them fellowship meals. Fellowship meals. Now, fellowship meal basically meant that um, two individuals or individuals are going to get together and they're going to eat and they're going to have friendship, intimacy, and unity. In fact, when you had these uh, table fellowship meals, the Pharisees would practice, and they get this term, extreme restrictive table fellowship. In other words, it's manners. There's certain things you're going to do when a Pharisee or somebody was going to have you come into their home, you've been invited to a meal. Now, when you come in there, there's going to be ceremonial cleanings and all this type of thing, situation. But what happens is this, is that you can, have to be at least equal or higher in the social or economically or, or having uh, prominence. Your status, it's all about status. And if I'm going to have you come over to my house, it's because it's a big deal. And when you come to my house, you better have some high credentials. And in my humble, no, I wouldn't have a humble opinion. In my prideful opinion, you better be at least equal or better if you're going to come around my table. And it's also a very big compliment to the one being invited. Jesus, by the way, he also had table fellowship. And he called his wide range table fellowship. In other words, he blew the restrictive table fellowship out of the water. Jesus was unique. He would eat with Gentiles or Jews. He'd eat with men or with women. He would eat with sinners, tax collectors, Pharisees, you name it. Jesus would sit down with that person and eat with them. And he did not have a problem with it. But everybody else did. Not Jesus. Now his intentionally... Jesus would violate every pharisaical tradition in the book when it came to fellowship meals. Jesus ate with the wrong crowd. He ate with unwashed hands. He criticized because of the practice of setting around in status. Jesus would point things out like that. Encouraging uh, serving instead of uh, being, he, he encouraged serving individuals instead of being served uh, he encouraged inviting those who could not repay, like the poor, the disabled. Jesus turned every meal into an opportunity. Think of that. Every meal was an opportunity. Every fellowship, every meeting could be an opportunity with Christ. Now, he knew the Pharisees did not like him. A lot of them had a real big problem with Jesus. He was transforming everything, and people were flocking to Christ, not just because he could heal, but because he could communicate. He could share the love of God. He, he showed people what mercy was. He, he demonstrated what forgiveness was about. He got, to so, he got to the point where people clamored to come in his presence. It, it wasn't forced. It was just everybody wanted to be there. And so here is Jesus, and all these things are going on, and so he's going to get an invite. But in every invitation Jesus gets, there's always someone trying to trap him, trying to mess with him. And that's why I think we're going to see some interesting things in this meal. I titled this sermon or this message, How to Get to Jesus' Heart. How do you get to Jesus' Heart? 
It starts off in the 36th verse. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. And so he went to the Pharisee's house and he reclined at the table. Uh, Boy, it's a lot different than going out today when Hoyt, you asked me to go out for lunch. This was totally different. Uh, You didn't have to worry about me being equal prominence or anything else like that. It was uh, because there was no way it was going to happen. When it comes to casting, you're the man, okay? But I want you to know that when uh, we go out to meals nowadays, we go, and I've been with several of you, and we sit around, we talk, and we talk about family. We may talk about the weather. We may talk about all kinds of little things. But here's the setting, and you've got to understand this, people, that in Jesus' time, and I had an opportunity back in uh, 2008 uh, to go into Israel with some others. We have five churches of Christ, by the way, in Canaan, uh, the area of Canaan, and uh, up near Galilee, and uh, they're independent Christian churches, uh, teaching immersion, uh, baptism, and the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. It's an exciting thing going on. But uh, we went into those different churches and went from Galilee on up in Jerusalem. But we got to go see some of the, the homes of Pharisees. And I mean, it was really enlightening to go into these places. They would have uh, their houses and a lot of them had two stories and some of them had like a top on top of a, looked like a patio almost. And, and it was all made with the, the clay and the, uh, and the moisture and hay and straw. And it was, it was amazing structures. But in there, they would uh, have a, a courtyard. And in that courtyard there is where they did a lot of eating. And when they had eating and meals, especially with the Pharisees, it was a teaching moment. It was a time where you would have a guest that would come, and anybody in the town, anybody around, could come and get around that outer place and listen to the conversation. And that's where a lot of teaching, a lot of of these ideas and debating, uh, all that took place, okay? Okay. And so when a Pharisee would have somebody come over to his house, it news got out that so-and-so was coming to this man's house, and they're going to be talking about some stuff, so we're going to all come around and we're going to listen. So tonight, you're going to be that people. You're going to a, a, a dinner party. You've not been invited to come in and sit around the table, or not sit, but lounge. They would lay down, maybe on their left side, and they would eat with their right hand. Their legs were stretched from them. And the host would be there, and the, the, the uh, guest that would be invited, the prominent guest would be right next to the host, and then others may be seated as importance would allow them. So Jesus reclined at the tables, what it says. He's invited. It certainly implies that they respect him. Evidently, this guy feels that Jesus is a teacher. They know he's a healer. But was he a prophet? And not so much worrying about whether he's God at this point, possibly. They're just wondering, who is this guy? If he's from God, and if he is a prophet, and if he is claiming to be Jesus, the Son of God, and we've got to dissect this a little bit. Well, they sit, and the atmosphere of the meal is just an amazing place. The townspeople is probably just shoulder to shoulder. A lot of them are there just because of the name of Jesus is there. And it could be Simon, the, the, the uh, Pharisee, his name was prominent. His friends were there. There are some people there that didn't like religion at all because it was so, so burdensome what the Pharisees had done with it and restrictions. So they just come to see two guys maybe argue about something. I don't know. They're just there. Verse 37, when a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town, learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. That tells us several things about this woman. But in verse 37, it just says, when a woman who had lived a sinful life, one of the things we know, she's not invited. You know why? She's not no status. If anything, she's a nobody. We know she's looked down on. She's looked down upon as a sinner. She's most likely, they concur, a prostitute. Not only that, she's been beaten down. Her self-image is destroyed and tattered and ragged, but you would never know it talking to her because she has a I don't care attitude. 
She's the object of criticism and insults. She's been sped upon. She's been spurned by the best people and used and abused by the worst. Inwardly, she's most likely broken, wounded, and shattered. And Perhaps some of us tonight can feel that. You may say, oh, I'm not one of those sinful women. But listen, let me tell you something. Without Jesus Christ, you are that sinful person. And life will not get better if this is all that's there. As you get older and as life goes, it gets a little more complicated sometimes. And if that's all you've got to look forward to in this life is what we can get out of the physical pleasures of it and the flesh and how we look and how we feel and what we get, then you're going to be very, very disappointed if that's all it is. But this woman felt miserable. Time has passed her now. Time is going on. Maybe no family, no one to lean upon. That might be why she's in the situation she's at. I don't know. I don't understand it, people. Do you understand who she is? I don't. I mean, to me, I, I, I would like to, though. I like to f- see who she is. And I see them every day. I'm around people like that. And you are, too. Dig in a little bit when it comes to the Bible. I, I never knew about, and I'm, I'm just, I, I thought about this today, Hoyt, and I don't want to pick on you, but what goes on behind a cast, you know? <laughs> I, I saw some objects, some aluminum objects that were going to go on a blower of a lawnmower thing. I don't know what it was. It was just some piece of stuff. But they had to make a bunch of those. And you look at the finished product, and you go, wow, that's awesome. But then you say, well, how did that come in? How do you do that? And then I started, he started showing me how they, how they make this. You've got to draw it up. You've got to have drawings. You've got to go over here to the wood part and chip out all these little woods and build a little this, that, and the other, and forms and framing and, and all the little things. And you put it all together, and it takes time and it takes effort. And then they come up with these little bit of things. Some of them are small hinges, and some are a little die and dat, a disc and bats and all that little stuff. But some of them are big, but they come all together, and then they finish it. And then they take that piece, and then it goes with some other pieces that may be made somewhere else, and it all comes together. And I thought about it as, as Christians. How our lives have also been formed, shaped, molded. Somebody outlined this and did a little bit of that, and if there's been some impurity coming in, if there's been some mistakes, guess what? The, the cast has been dyed, and here we are, and this woman has been dyed. She's not a good woman. It would be one for the scrap pile. But she's in the presence of Jesus. She is uh, going to hear him teach. Maybe she's heard him talk before, say something before. Maybe she has heard gracious words. Maybe it's his speech about God's love and mercy and forgiveness that she's never heard anybody in the so-called religion or religious realm talk about before. But she's heard him, and she is a broken person. And then there's some, something, maybe there's some kind of glimmer of hope. How did she get inside, though? Because uh, according to William Barclay in his commentary, he says it was the custom that the rabbi was at a meal in such a house. All kinds of people came in. They were quite free to listen. And the pearls of wisdom which fell from their lips. Simon doesn't seem so alarmed that this woman is in or near her house because there's a whole crowd of people. But she wasn't invited in because all of a sudden she's there. So this is what we Americans would call she's crashing the party. And she wasn't asked to crash. She just comes right on in. Look what takes place. This is in verse 37. It says in Luke 7, verse 37, she broke an alabaster jar of perfume. This was most likely her livelihood. This little jar of perfume is what she used, her fragrance, to capture the attention of her men or whatever it was in her occupation. And she stood behind him at his feet and she's weeping. She's standing at his feet because he's reclined at a table and his legs are stretched. She might be near the wall. I'm not sure. 
But it says that she's weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears. That's a lot of weeping, people. Have you ever cried where you can't control it? And she's got tears coming out. She's trying to hold it in. She's always been on one of those tough shells. You know what I mean? You can throw anything you want to at me. It's not going to hurt me. Bricks and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me. Well, that's a lie. And now all those things in life, well up into this woman as she's standing at the feet of Jesus who's reclined, having a meal, and they're going to be talking about stuff and she hears nothing. I heard someone tell me the other day that when things get really, really bad, when people talk, it's that they're like this, you don't really hear, you just noise. I imagine she's in that realm. She don't hear nothing. She's just boo-hooing. And, and she notices his feet getting, got stains on them. You know, the stains uh, back in that day, and when you go walking around there, it's very dusty and dirty. And when those teardrops are hitting, and it says she got so many, it wet his feet. So what she does, she bends over, and she gets down, she has her hair, and she lifts her hair down. And boy, the crowd probably is going, oh, what's going on here? This doesn't look good. You know, women don't let their hair down like that. And she's wiping his feet with her hair. And then she's kissed kiss them. And then she's pouring perfume on them. As if to say, I'm sorry, I've messed up your, your feet with my sinful tears. Early in the meal, there's no focus on that woman. But now all the eyes are looking at her. And she sees nothing. She's not listening to nothing except those words of Christ, those comforting voice of a shepherd. And as her hair falls and she's down there wiping them, the next thing she begins is to kiss his feet. We look at this as maybe a disgusting implication, but in that culture, kissing the feet is a considered a common mark of deep, deep reverence. Finally, she pours that scented oil on his feet out of the perfume vial and such Jewish women commonly wore around their neck. Nor is this one, a one-time event because it is written, and I know the preacher back there would know, and some of you others who know about Greek, it's an ongoing thing. It's, it's, kind of, it's an imperfect tense, which means continual. She's continually wiping, continually kissing, continually pouring, indicates repeat action. And I'm sure now that once this flask of perfume is open, almost immediately it's detected by everyone that's in the room and outside the walls and all those people who are walking up down the street. While Jesus had been at the center of the focus up to now, all eyes turn on that woman who's literally bawling, crying, riping, putting the perfume on. In verse 39, when the Pharisee, name is Simon, he's the one who invited Jesus, saw him, saw this. He didn't say it out loud, but he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he might be a good teacher, but if he were a prophet, he would know who's touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. It doesn't take much of a mind reader to look at Simon's eyes. It's probably one of those things where it just kind of shook their head, you know. You ever seen people when they're disgusted at somebody doing something? You don't have to use words. Have you ever done something? And uh, I got my lovely wife, Sharon is her name. And she's back home and uh, maybe a couple of months when she's finished all, all this stuff, when I go places, I'll have her with me because I sure do miss having her. And I'd eat better when she's around. <laughs> okay, well, but anyway, uh, Sharon is one of those individuals that when I do something that's really not right, it's really dumb, she just gives me that look. You guys know what I'm talking about. You get the look, like, <laughs> it's just like, uh, you ain't got to say it. And, and Simon Peter has evidently that look. And, um, and so Jesus, all of a sudden, does, he just says, asks a question. 
Uh, in fact, uh, you go down in verse 39, it goes on a little further. He says, Simon, I have something I want to ask, or something to tell you. He says, I have something to tell you. And this is where they begin to do that little, uh, this is where Simon is like, okay, I, I want to hear this. Because, uh, yeah, go ahead, give me a little test. I, we'll take you on. Now remember, Jesus is the Son of Man and the Son of God. He's healed. He's raised the dead. Jesus knows the thoughts of demons. Jesus is the King of kings. He's the creator of all things. Jesus is understanding this, and yet he's in flesh. And when that Simon, the Pharisee, who thinks he's such a saint, says if Jesus only knew that that was a sinner, and Jesus could have looked at him and blasted him over the water, said, you want to talk about sins? I could write yours in the sand, which he probably did later on. He was writing there some sins in the sands or whatever he was writing. He could have shamed that man right off the bat. He's the king of kings. He's the redeemer. He's the God who gives forgiveness and mercy, has salvation. And that, that man, Simon, has the ideas in his mind that this guy doesn't even know that that woman's a sinner. So Jesus says this, tell me, teacher. And he begins a little parable there. Two men own money to a certain money lender. One owed them by over 50 or 500 denarii. That's a lifetime of wages. While the other had about, owed him about 50, about a week or so of wages. Neither of them had a money to pay back, pay him back. So he canceled the debts. He canceled both of them. Now suppose, uh, he says, uh, now which of them would love him more? So Simon said, well, that's the easy one. I suppose that the one who had the bigger debt canceled, you've judged correctly, Jesus said. And then Jesus, in verses 44 through 47, says, Simon, I want you to know something. When I came into this room, and I like the way it says in verse 44, he'd been talking to who? Simon the Pharisee. Now get this picture. As the crowds of people, as a woman, Jesus is reclining. He's talking to Simon, but he says, as he turns and he looked toward the woman, but he's talking to Simon, and he says, Simon, do you see this woman? So Jesus is now looking at her, friends. Get, get the picture here. Understand the importance of this moment. And he says, do you see this woman? He didn't say, do you see the sinner? He didn't say, do you see this object? Do you see this woman? I came into your house, and you did not... Put, give me any water for my feet. That was one of the, that, that's one of the things Simon should have done immediately. If you really respect somebody, have a little pan of water there, and one of the servants come and wash your feet. He said, but, the, but she's wet my feet with her tears, and she's wiped them with her hair. But you didn't give me a kiss. Now here we greet one another with a handshake. Some places may not, but you know, we, we try to greet one another with a handshake. And, uh, and uh, but hey, back then they, they did a little kiss there on the cheek. That was the custom. That was what you're supposed to do. He said, you didn't give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I've entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. And you not put oil on my head. And when you come into a home back in that day and time, it was dirty, dusty, end of the day. And the guest or the one who had honored the Pharisee, would, when you come in, they would pour oil on your head. It would be soothing. It would kind of calm things down, cool you off. He says, you didn't pour no oil on my, on my head, but she's poured perfume on my feet. Jesus' point isn't hard to guess. Simon's actions have shown little love. But this hurt and sinful woman has lavished love on Jesus. Now, building up on this, this brief little parable, Jesus now turns the object from love to forgiveness. And this is why I love it. This is a part here as we kind of conclude this first meal about Jesus' heart has been touched because of the love offered to him, shown to him, and, and, and demonstrated. And in verse 47, Therefore I tell you, her many sins... All those ugly things, all those words, all those hateful things, all her, her lifestyle and whoever messed her up or who had just thrown her aside and all the mess ups, all, the cast die that was all broken. 
has been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, Simon, he just says loves little. And I'm wondering, and when I'm in that crowd, where would I be? Can I put myself as that sinful woman? Yeah, I've been sinful, and I need to weep at the foot of Jesus, or the feet of Jesus. Would I be in the crowd and one of those who would be listening and watching, observing how churches, how Christians handle sinners? I'd be in that crowd, and I'd watch that of a religious person, and I'd watch how a sinner would come in contact with Jesus and see how it's being done. So am I in the crowd? Am I an observer? Or am I Simon? I don't like to be Simon. <laughs> My pride would say, no, you're not Simon, but let me tell you something. I'm many times a Simon. And I'm one of those who may say, hey, look, in my life, God has been very good in a lot of ways, and I've had a lot of blessings, and so I can say that I love the Lord so much, but do I really understand the love of loving God and going through the boundaries that people have to go through sometimes? You see how God will come and take and pick them up and reshape them and remold them and recast them? And then just look at them with love and mercy and say, this is my child. This isn't just a creation. Why God, Jesus could look around and say, all of y'all are my creation. All of y'all have been cast, but only those who come and take the purity of righteousness of God's love. Now we get close here to verse 48 and 50, and I stop at verse 50. Then Jesus said to the woman, who had evidently broken down every barrier and is understanding the love of God and has demonstrated her love to Christ. He says, your sins are forgiven. She's never heard that. She's never experienced that load of sin being gone. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And then Jesus turns again and he looks at this woman as he's outstretched, as she's crumbled at his feet with the oil, the tears, the hair. Your faith saved you. Go in peace. I can see that woman's face. It's all wet. It's dirty. Hair all messed up. But boy, have you ever seen a person get peace? I've seen people get bad news and they get shocked. But to have immense, total peace. This is like, I'm breathing. For the first time, I'm really breathing. I can't remember when I've been able to have a breath like this. And I don't hate these people that made fun of me. I don't want to serve sin anymore. I'm at the feet of the one I love. She didn't want to leave the feet of Jesus. Friends, this is, uh, this is how you get to Jesus' heart. Is you just break it down and you give it over to Christ. There may be somebody here tonight. You've just been observing Jesus, observing life. But you never really understand in his fullness. It's going to take work and effort, but I'm going to tell you something. God's going to be right there to take every little piece and put it into its place. To mold you for a purpose. Maybe there's somebody today that's totally broken. Isn't it something that a person who's in sin can come and say, Jesus... I truly, truly am sorry. I want to repent and follow you now. I want to be at your feet for the rest of my life. And all you need to do now, according to Jesus' teaching the apostles, is repent of your sins, confess him, and be baptized. And your sins are gone. You're re-died. <laughs> your disc has been reformed. And now, 
You're going to be created in His image. And I pray that you take that opportunity. If you've not been immersed, baptized into Jesus Christ, why would you wait? And if you have been, and you've gotten away from Him, He can fix those things too. We're going to have an invitation hymn this evening. It'll be on the big board, I imagine. I don't know what's going on in your life and in your heart, or what may be. It may be way where you're seated, or it may be you want to come down and just say, well, I need to have prayer. I want to talk to the elders and pray with them. And Maybe I'm just one of those individuals that need to get straight again for Christ. Whatever the need is, whatever the prayer would be, I pray that would be the time as we stand and sing.